Hello, uh, good morning. I'm Ken Larson, director of uh, MIT City Science. Uh, and uh, we're going to shift gears a little bit, talk about cities. This, is, this portion of the program is our City Science Summit. And, and first of all, I just want to say how uh, pleased I am that we're collaborating for the second year with Technology Review to put on this climate tech conference, and uh, we hope to do more. All right, why cities? 70%. That's a lot more than 50%. 70% of global emissions are generated in urban areas. Uh, and the IPCC report, Intergovernmental um, Panel on Climate Change, had a quote from their report last year that I think is, is really revealing. How new cities and towns are designed, constructed, managed, and powered will lock in behavior, lifestyles, and future urban greenhouse gases. Um, all right, designed, constructed, managed, powered, that's a lot of stuff. That goes way beyond just, uh, just climate tech. Behavior, lifestyles, I think these are the wicked problems if we're going to address climate change, and we're focused uh, on, on some of those challenges. Lock-in is really scary. That means it's very hard to change. So I think this sentence sort of says it all in terms of what the challenge is. Now, just quickly how we got here. This is a natural ecosystem in harmony. It's got all the feedback mechanisms we all learned about in high school. This is a human settlement from several thousand years ago, and for literally thousands of years, these human settlements operated with the feedback mechanisms, something like what you find in a natural ecosystem. The food and the resources that people use in their daily life was matched to the population, and it achieved some kind of equilibrium. And then this all changed with the Industrial Revolution. We had factories and global supply chains. We had centralized systems for sewers and water and, and power and the like. And then we had this transportation revolution at the end of the 19th century where trams extended the city up. But the biggest change was Probably 1927, that's when the Supreme Court validates zoning and cities all over the U.S. and ultimately around the world adapt, adopted this, um, this zoning methodology. It also happened to be 1927, the 15th million Ford Model T rolled off the, the assembly line. And what this led to were these vast housing zones, these monocultures of housing and also office zones, office parks where people would drive to every day. Millions of people ultimately had to move twice a day these long distances. This Kendall Square where we are, 1966, it's product of the Industrial Revolution. It, uh, in 1966, had empty lots, empty buildings, and there was the Kendall Square Urban Renewal Plan put in place around this time, and over the next 40 years, it became a really amazing office innovation district, but as a community, it was quite dysfunctional. This shows how it played out over time. So you're looking at offices, but also the different types of housing and amenities that are needed in a community, and it got continuously out of sync. This is where we are today. It also resulted in tremendous CO2 emissions, 17.19. These are the, what we calculate in our local climate model to be the average emissions per person per year. Now, that's both operational and embodied energy. 2.5, a lot less than that 17.19. These are the average carbon budget uh, average carbon emissions for every person on the planet if we're to have an 80% chance of limiting global warming to 2 degrees centigrade. I think 1.5 is probably off the table by now. So um, we, we reimagined Kendall Square with a bunch of interventions that could help approach that number. I presented this last year. I'm going to go quickly through it just to recap and then talk about the new work we're doing. So here we looked at decarbonizing the grid. We just took the Massachusetts roadmap. We made a little bit of progress with that. Uh, we then looked at 100% electric vehicles. 42,000 people pulse into Kendall Square and out every day. 
Very little housing here. We've made a little progress there, adding a lot of embodied energy to reduce the operational energy hybrid work. We, we looked at maybe 50% of the people working remotely that had a very small difference. Then we looked at live-work symmetry. That would be I mean building housing for all 42,000 people so people could live near where they work. Big difference. Almost as much as the rest of those combined. But then we also looked at local walkable access to amenities. The sum of those two had tremendous impact. We looked at hyper-efficient uh, housing using the kind of innovation we're working on in our lab to create smaller spaces that function like they're bigger, pretty good impact. People live near where they work, have local amenities, you don't need cars, so we look at lightweight uh, autonomous mobility modes, new energy sources, not enough surface area for solar locally, so we're looking at high density power, you know, small modular nuclear maybe in the 30s and ultimately fusion in the 1940s, you know, but we have to be thinking about now the infrastructure for, for fusion-ready cities, plant-based diet, etc., and all the other things you've been hearing about during this conference. But the point is, the things that we can do at the scale of the community probably will be the most impactful if we can find ways to do that. Remember that IPCC report talked about behavior. I think a lot of this is about behavior change, so, but we need to change the behavior of the property owners and the developers, incentivizing pro-social, low-carbon development. It's probably the biggest thing we can do. Nobody really has figured out how to do that. We have a few ideas. This is the Seagram's building designed by Mies van der Rohe, the founder of the Bauhaus. And he was a pretty radical guy. He created this monument <laughs> in Manhattan with a big plaza. People loved it. And so a few years later, when they redid the zoning, they created incentives to create more plazas. You got a bonus, build more area if you create a public plaza. And then overnight, the behavior changed of all the developers. This shows all the projects where they, they got a, a plaza bonus uh, to build um, more of their high value uh, real estate space. So zoning can change behavior. But that was a very simple mapping of one benefit to one uh, public amenity. So we're looking at an alternative, dynamic incentive-based algorithmic zoning. And just how might this work? So you'd have a commission as part of a new zoning ordinance that evaluates all the current performance, the economic, social, environmental performance of each community, decides what is lacking, maps incentives, to, I mean, it literally could be hundreds of possible assets that the community needs. A developer then selects from that list, there's a pro forma that goes into, that could, uh, without any negotiation, determine the allowable floor area and the benefits, and then these, these incentives are algorithmically adjusted as each project gets built. So uh, you're always creating optimal incentives for the goals of the community. So how could that work? So here we are, 2023 in Kendall Square today. Uh, as we saw, there are very few housing, housing uh, assets, very few amenities relative to the job. So you then start to dynamically map these incentives. So you don't have enough senior housing or early career housing raise the incentives. You need more essential housing for the workforce, for the, for the police and the, the people that work at the fire department. Now you need more career housing. So you see dynamically these incentives can be adjusted uh, over time, converging on some optimal relationship of jobs and housing and amenities. So achieving equilibrium, something like what you have in a natural ecosystem. That's the big idea. Okay, so let's just look what happened. This, this starting in 1980, see all these office projects in red were built. So you're adding more and more jobs, communities getting out of whack. Now we introduce this algorithmic incentive-based zoning. You get a lot more housing in yellow, you get a lot more in incentives, and you achieve something like uh, harmony. We, we think of this as civic homeostasis, okay? Again, something like a natural ecosystem. Now. You might rightly say, okay, how, how will a community ever accept that kind of density? I mean, it's pretty radical. We're looking at building 
in the case of Kendall Square, housing for 42,000 people with all the schools and amenities and everything that would be needed. And there is this profound NIMBY opposition to change that we have uh, in this country and all over the world. So how can you turn not in my backyard to yes in my backyard, NIMBY to YIMBY? <laughs> so, uh, one idea that we're interested in is incentivizing community acceptance of density and community transformation. So you have as a right, you give a bonus to the developer. By the way, if it streamlines approvals and reduces risk and time, they'd all love it. I, I've talked with eno enough of them. But the idea here is you increase the density, you take a portion of that increased value and you put it into a community en endowment. And then you can have a separate process that determines how those benefits are distributed to the community. The closer you live to a project, the more money, literally check, you might get. Could it be fractional ownership? So you're actually sharing the equity with the community. Could be a function of how long you've lived in the community, uh, what your financial need is. If you live and work in the community, you could, you could get more. And by the way, there, there needs to be a voting process as well. So all of this could determine your voice in affecting the future of your community. And uh, it, it's entirely possible that a, that a developer could set the minimum and the maximum density that they're willing to build, and then the community, local community I'm talking about, the people that live near this um, proposed development, could just crank a lever and adjust the density. So maybe if you stick with the as of right baseline density, nothing goes into the endowment. If the community decides on low density, then a modest amount goes into the endowment. Medium density, even more. High density, even more. So the community has a stake in this project. They're getting two things. They're getting the assets they need to create a high-functioning community, and they're sharing the wealth that, by the way, is a function of the network that that project is in. It's the collective uh, impact of the community that that project is in. So. Um, NIMBY to YIMBY. Uh, now to pull this off, there's lots of technology innovation that we, we, we would need to develop, and just a few of them. First of all, you have to set the metrics and goals and have all the math models to calculate what the goals of a particular community would be. You need to have pretty sophisticated data analytics to determine though that social and economic uh, and environmental performance. Uh, you, you need to have, then have the simulation tools in place to predict what the future might be. This is agent-based modeling and all kinds of generative systems we can build uh, and, and bring to the process. You need to then have entirely new way of community engagement so you have more data-driven, evidence-based community decision-making consensus platforms. and. And then you're, you're creating much more complexity in the system because each developer is making long-term commitments as part of this bonus. So it's a great opportunity to use public ledgers and smart contracts that are self-enforcing. All of this collectively, I think of as climate tech. So I guess I, I would encourage you to think beyond climate tech just for the systems that are in the, in, in the environment. And we can all geek out about battery chemistry and autonomous vehicles and et cetera. But I think this kind of technology is potentially even more impactful. These are the community scale solutions that I think can address the lion's share of the emissions that we have to address. All right, so what we're going to do now is we're gonna have a series of short talks. We have our City Science Network, 10 cities around the world. You'll hear quick updates about what cities are doing in Chile, Andorra, Germany, Taiwan, Canada, China, Mexico, Spain, and Israel. Thank you. <laughs>